Welcome back everyone, Michael here with Offshore Citizen. I am here in beautiful Alberta, Canada, in the woods near where I grew up, spending some time visiting my family, and forest fire season has come early this year. It is one of the things that I kind of dislike about Canada. I, when I was away for four years, I had this fantasy in my head that, well, you know, Canada is actually quite nice in the summer. And to be fair, the weather has been very good uh, most of the time since I've been here. I've been here for a couple weeks now. Uh, but the problem is, when the weather is good, there's forest fires and mosquitoes. So it's never quite that good, uh, even in the summer, and it never really gets that, uh, that warm. So you may see around, somewhere around here, oh yeah, there you can see all the, the smoke, the haze from the forest fires, which are, I mean, in some cases close and in some places far away. And they do seem to be more frequent these days than they used to be when I was growing up. To give you some idea of a tangible example that I see of sort of Western decline and what I'm increasingly referring to as, you know, the system that created the problems is incapable of solving them, which means that I think there's a structural problem in some of these nations, as much as these nations in some respects are great, right? Like, I don't want to be somebody who says, oh my gosh, it's all bad. It's not all bad, right? There's plenty of things to love in a lot of these developed Western nations. However, uh, there are just systems structurally that are kind of out of control. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of them in a moment uh, related to banking. But here, here's an example. So clearly you can see there is smoke, right? Uh, today, the banks were closing early because they got some, this is locally uh, where I am here today, because someone in Toronto, for those who are not familiar with Canada, this is like the opposite side of the country, in charge of something environmental, decided the air quality was not good enough, and so they should send people home. Now, I ask you, where do you think the air quality is worse? Out here or in the building? It's probably worse out here. So I don't know what they think they're trying to do. This is an example of, to me, just the asinine kind of health and environmental policies that get implemented. Not that a person shouldn't care about health, they should, and they also should care about environment, but then there's health and environment that just make no practical sense. It is kind of ridiculous. So anyway, uh, in addition to that, they were apparently planning on closing the schools for the same reason. You're like, why? How, are the how is it better for the kids? They're probably gonna go outside and play and inhale a whole bunch of smoke. I mean, if you wanna tell them to leave the town or something, that would be one thing. But uh, no, they're not. They are closing the schools, and this is just an example of, to me, just totally deranged policies that are in place in a lot of these places. And, uh, and just kind of the, like, like 50 years ago, you would never would have seen this. And people were fine. In fact, the average lifespan in the US has now declined for the second time in a row. And so people are now living, I think it's less long than they were 20 years ago or something. So tells you a little bit about how well the policies are working. And this is from somebody who generally tends to support the idea that the world is getting better, that you would, should rather live today than, you know, 100 years ago. Lots of things to appreciate, etc. In spite of that, there are definitely some, uh, some drawbacks that are uh, being experienced here. So I'm just stepping over a big log. Anyway, let's talk about today's subject. Today's subject is the subject of what really makes quality banking. And this came from a conversation I was having with a client the other day who had, uh, I often, so I've done a video previously where I talked about don't bank in these places. Don't do offshore banking there. And if you go and read the comments, you're gonna see a bunch of people asking about a whole bunch of places that I generally consider bad. And some people feeling kind of offended that I would say that Belize is crap, practically all the Caribbean is crap, uh, almost most of these island nations are very poor banking places. But then it begs the question, which is, what makes quality banking? And so I was talking to this client who had some experience prior to coming to work with us about uh, with banking, and I said, well, okay, let me explain to you why I'm saying these places are not good and what that means. And as I started to describe it, he said, everything that you're talking about, I have experienced firsthand. I know exactly what you're talking about, it's terrible. So, let's discuss right now, uh, mosquitoes. Uh, see, mosquito season. Anyway, uh, let, let's discuss right now a little bit about what it means when I say uh, banks are not high quality and what high quality is and what you should look for and hence why you shouldn't go unless as kind of like a last resort, listen, Sometimes you just cannot get bank accounts in some of these other parts of the world. If you can't get bank accounts anywhere else, you know, you have to deal with what you have to deal with. But 
all things being equal, if you can choose, these are like the last choice that you should go for are things like these Caribbean banks, things like uh, banks in Belize, etc., etc., which are commonly put out by some sort of, I don't know, offshore service provider or something who just wants to sell a bank account in a company and doesn't really, either has no practical experience or, uh, or doesn't care. And uh, both of those are pretty reprehensible as far as I'm concerned. So let's dive in and talk about quality banking. Before we do, if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button, hit the all notification bell. Welcome, I am Michael. Hopefully you'll subscribe and enjoy the content. Go and check out a bunch of our other videos. There's lots of great content out here. And pay attention to uh, some of the, the latest to upcoming things. If you want practical help with this, if you want help with relocating abroad, getting residencies, citizenships, if you want to legally plan to optimize your tax globally. Unfortunately, most people don't really understand how international tax works. And so we're some of the foremost experts in the world on the subject, specializing in the gap between nations. There's good people to advise you in different countries, but they typically don't understand the gaps between nations. And so you get CPAs giving bad advice uh, about other countries. And it was on some YouTube channel recently correcting one of these um, and, and many others. And so we're happy to help you with that. If you would like help, please reach out to us. You can book a call with me, calendly.com forward slash Michael dash Rosmer, link in the description below, or send a message through offshorecitizen.net. Okay, cool. So quality banking, what does quality banking mean? Quality banking, I would divide into a few different categories. First of all, service, okay? If you're banking in the Caribbean, what you're gonna find is typically the hours suck and the competency of service is just not that great, okay? And by the way, it's not just the Caribbean, I'm using that as an example, but it's very common there. So there's this term we'd frequently have, which is banker's hours, right? I remember the first time I had a Cayman Islands bank account and I was used to being able to call 24 seven to my bank and say, hey, I have a problem, <laughs> fix it for me. You do not have that, right? These sorts of things are not available. They have a more extreme version of banker's hours. And so that just reduces the quality of what you're doing. Now, you can also have far less sophistication. So the understanding that the bankers have of your situation, of business, of the world, of you know financial products, of investments, of loans, et cetera, are simply lower. And even if I want to be honest and critical, if you're talking about loans and financial products in say UAE, the sophistication is far lower than you'll get in some place like Singapore or Switzerland or the US. That is just the reality. They are working on improving it. And you know, the good thing about UAE is that they improve fairly quickly, but the bottom line is it's just not at that level. So if you were to, for example, bring structured products, which are a huge deal at UBS and a really interesting space, I'm actually doing a, another project related to structured products. Um, if you were to do that, like they just don't have, there's not the sophistication around that sort of thing. And so, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, but just realize that the quality of service, the sophistication of the service is not typically going to be as high in these areas. And that can be frustrating. Okay. Now, the second thing that you have to consider is safety. I've talked about this a bunch before. There is a lot of people right now who are talking a bunch about US banks. And I've done some videos explaining what's going on with US banks, what I figured would happen, et cetera. More or less what I uh, expressed would likely happen has happened. As I said, for depositors, it's kind of a nothing, nothing burger. Yeah, for bondholders and stockholders, that's maybe really bad. And certainly for the overall economy and the ability to get loans, that uh, could also be a problem because you have smaller banks who simply aren't able to give loans and that's, that could be an issue. But uh, there's a lot of recency bias going on out there where people go, oh my gosh, the American banking system is at risk of crashing. There's apparently been a trillion dollars of deposits removed from the American banking system over the last while, which is like never happened before. It's a huge amount of money. And people think, oh, you know, I'd rather have my money in India or in Europe or whatever. And the problem I have with that is first and foremost, you haven't seen a single depositor lose money in Silicon Valley Bank, in Signature Bank, in First Republic, in uh, whatever the, uh, Silvergate, all, all these banks that are going down, not a single depositor has lost money. Uh, Nassim Taleb was busy posting something on Twitter a while ago, talking about, oh, you know, you should just let these banks fail. You know, people don't know. I mean, banks were going down like crazy in the 80s. And I was like, yeah, but how many people actually lost money? 
the reality is they back to the depositors. And the reason for that is partially because of, you know, FDIC and the Fed and all this sort of thing. But it's also simply because of a strong banking ecosystem where other banks will buy up those banks. If you go back to one of the largest bank failures in history was Washington Mutual. What happened to Washington Mutual? They got picked up by JP Morgan Chase. And so the depositors get affected? Nope. They just woke up one day and they were banking with JP Morgan Chase instead of Washington Mutual. So that sort of thing is simply important to understand is that in some of these banks, you have an ecosystem that will protect you far above simply deposit insurance. I've often said to people, if you have to worry about deposit insurance, you have bigger problems. <laughs> like you should not be in a position where deposit insurance is your main concern. Yes, it's a nice fallback. It's kind of like, it's literally insurance, but it's not the main thing that you should be paying attention to. You should be paying attention to the overall ecosystem. When a bank like Caledonian, which was a Cayman Islands bank went down, guess who stepped in to protect them? Nobody. Bank went down, depositors could have lost money. Uh, it turned out in the end, they had their funds frozen and you know it was locked up for some period of time and then most of the money people got out. But you know wh where was the ecosystem to protect them? That would have never happened in HSBC. It would have never happened in Barclays. It would have never happened in Bank of America or Chase or Citi or you know one of these big banks because there's an ecosystem there to protect you. And so anytime you're dealing with these small offshore banks or something like a Belize bank, here's a piece of information. In Belize, there are two banking licenses. You can have international banking licenses where people uh, go and deal with, uh, or the, those banks only deal with foreigners, and then you have domestic banking licenses. So for example, Scotiabank, uh, which is a big Canadian bank, relatively high quality bank, is uh, in Belize. But you can't, it's not, it doesn't have an international banking license, it's got a domestic banking license. So if you go to someplace like K International Bank, which, look, has withstood the test of time, people haven't lost money, that's good, um, you know, what you're dealing with is a bank that simply is not protected by the local system. And so the chances that those banks will go under, not just because of, you know, people are like, oh, it's a problem with fractional reserve, it's a problem with this, that, and the other thing. Like, the reality is that as a depositor, you can't worry about all that stuff. There typically aren't full reserve banks, uh, or what they would call narrow banking. It's typically not a thing. Once in a while there is, but not typically. Um, and so you want an ecosystem that will protect your money. Very, very important. And similarly, brings us to the next part, which is one of the biggest risks with banking today is not anything to do with actually losing your money. It's to having accounts frozen, having that bank cut off from the US dollar system or something like that. So for example, FBME or Bank, which is uh, Cyprus, well, they're in Cyprus and uh, another place, but Cyprus was the notable one. Uh, was cut off from the U.S. banking system. Uh, there was a St. Vincent Bank that was cut off from the U.S. banking system. There was Banca Privada in Andorra, cut off from the U.S. banking system, etc. What happens to you when that happens? You simply cannot transact. You're in trouble. And so this has a couple consequences for it. Number one is you're in a situation where you simply will have to go through more excruciating pain and it will be more expensive for you to do normal banking transactions. So if you're banking in one of these kind of Caribbean banks, uh, whatever, I'm, again, Caribbean is a proxy. Some people will ask about Cook Islands. Cook Islands is basically the same, okay? Uh, most of these places, basically the same. If you ask about Seychelles or most of the time, if you just ask about any of these places, mostly the same, okay? Unless it is a bank that banks for a significant portion of the local population, and there's a reasonable population there, I, I would say just discard it if you can. Again, if you don't have any choice, great, you don't have any choice. You, you deal with what you have to deal with. But in most cases, best not to deal with them. So, uh, or if you're in, you know, if there's like a, a large ecosystem. So again, First Republic or something like that, look, you've got an ecosystem here. We saw what happened. Um, so anyway, what will happen? These banks don't actually have, say, a connection to, say, the Federal Reserve, right? Even if you bank at RBC in Canada, they have a direct connection. You're not going to lose your... Uh, correspondent banking through RBC. Will not happen. TD, same thing. Bank of America, like these guys have direct connections. They're not going to lose it. Uh, in fact, literally, we can see how HSBC in Mexico, it was so bad that they had the windows in their, uh, the bars at the banks were specifically designed to have this hole to fit 
the cash for the uh, drug cartels through there. It was specifically sized based on that. They were facilitating money laundering. They got fined like $9 billion for it. Terrible for the shareholders, but guess what? No depositors lost money. The bank didn't lose its connection to the US banking system, et cetera, et cetera. That is what you can expect in some of these other banks because they're just simply too significant to the system. And so, yeah, that's, that's a big deal. And so when it's a small bank, you know, they've got a few hundred million dollars in deposits or something like this, which you really don't want. What's going to happen? Their transactions are going to get scrutinized. People are going to say, why are you banking in St. Vincent? Why are you banking in Belize? Probably pissing off a lot of Belize bankers right now. But anyway, um, the, the reality is they're going to say probably only money launderers and tax evaders do that. So we're going to scrutinize all these transactions. Because of that, it's going to be harder for you to transact. That bank is at risk all the time of losing its correspondent relationships. And because of that, it's going to scrutinize you. So you're going to get scrutinized double as much twice, which makes it more expensive and more of a hassle. I think I've told a story on this channel before. A number of years ago, we were transferring about $2.4 million uh, from a bank in the Caribbean. It took like three or four months to get the money sent. We had to escalate to the CEO of the bank. It was like a huge hassle uh, to get it out. And it turned out, I mean, the whole bank only had like $400 million in assets or something. So, you know, you're talking about a pretty substantial share of the, uh, the bank's assets. You don't want to be a substantial share of any bank's assets. Bad, bad sign. Okay. So bottom line that you will have less hassles typically sending money, less hassles typically receiving money. The chances that your money will get stuck in there are lower and the chances that you won't be able to get your money back will be lower. So that's another thing. The, the fourth thing related to quality of banking, this will be the last one, is in terms of the infrastructure, okay? What's the quality of the online banking like? Now, to be fair, you know, Bank of America's online banking looks like it was designed in the 90s. It probably was. If you go to some of the major banks, especially their commercial banking, uh, which is less customer uh, facing, it, it looks really bad. But the bottom line is there are services available that are pretty sophisticated for you. Card services, various different financial controls, things that allow you to do stuff online electronically. Uh, the interfaces are better, the mobile apps are better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? All this stuff, all that plumbing, that infrastructure is, you can expect generally quite good in what I would call more quality institutions. And obviously there's a spectrum in there, but you will frequently have quite bad in these others. Now, yes, there is some extent to which electronic money institutions have come on and helped to solve some of that. When the back end plumbing of banking has had a really poor front end, they've added a nice front end and made the experience considerably better. This is TransferWise, Revolut, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is great, right? That's better for the customer experience. But the bottom line is you're in a situation when you have uh, these other banks that you're just more likely to have problems like that, uh, including security. And who wants to lose money in their bank? Very, very bad thing. So anyway, I hope that helps kind of explain what it means when I say you want quality institutions, what are quality institutions all about, et cetera, what can you expect, what's the difference, and therefore why you should avoid most of these. Most banks that are called offshore banks are probably bad banks. It's just the way that it goes. Granted, sometimes even big banks are also terrible, and, uh, and sometimes the service can be really awful in banks that you would expect to do a little better, but that is what it is. If you want help with banking or any of these international structures, reach out to us, give the video a thumbs up, share it with your friends, hit subscribe, and I will see you on the next video.